Welcome to Houston Sports Talk with your host, Robert Land. Thanks for checking into the best Houston sports podcast and joining me to talk about the early season Rockets is Frank from HTX Chop Shop, who we're planning to have on with us weekly once the Astros season is over with in a couple of weeks. Great to have you back, Frank. Hey, great to be back, man. Appreciate you for inviting me out to talk some basketball. All right, let's talk uh, some positives to start off with. I know the Rockets started off one and four, but following the Jazz game on Wednesday night, here's some numbers that I pulled up. They're dead last in defensive efficiency last year. They were last year dead last. They've gone from 30th to 21st in defense. They've gone from dead last in free throw percentage last year to 16th. Massive improvement on the glass. They were dead last in the league in rebounds per game right now. They're fourth in the NBA, fourth from dead last for the rebounding. Give a little bit of credit to Jabari and Tari, who we're going to get into later. But Frank, Jalen Green quietly added 1.2 rebounds per game, along with 5.3 more points. And everybody's talking about that, of course. But, you know, you've seen the improvement from him. And and I know you're not surprised about that. No, I'm not. And, um, you know, credit to his work ethic. I think one thing that I've been most impressed with him is not even the offensive side, is his defensive um, effort. You know, he still makes a lot of mistakes and he still struggles sometimes off ball, but I don't know if you've been watching, man, his intensity on garden ball handlers is just at a different level now. And it seems like he really takes pride in being one, like a two-way guard. And um, I know he had a bad game against the Jazz yesterday, but, you know, I think overall for the season, I would say, what he's done so far and taking this leap, he's sticking out more than anybody else to me in his rookie class uh, of the 2021 draft class. Um, as far as the Rockets as a team, uh, you know, yeah, they've, they've improved on defense. I would say that their effort across the board uh, for all their players, Kevin Porter Jr., he's uh, really focused on that end of the ball. And uh, I think that on that side, they just look like they're taking pride in it. I don't know who to attribute that to. Is it the um, hiring of some of the new coaches that we have or just maturity? But um, definitely something is, uh, you know, like I was telling uh, uh, my friend uh, Space that you can go, you can't go anywhere but up from zero. So we were dead last. Now we're kind of in the mix. We'll see how long that sustains uh, going forward. But yeah, I really like on the defensive end and the effort end, it looks like the guys are really trying. Yeah, I'm going to stick with that mostly for the nice stuff. And we're going to get to some (laughs) other things to talk about in the defense. We're going to come back to that. But I just want to remind everybody to support the show by subscribing and commenting on YouTube. Look for our live Astros World Series post games and our live Texans Titans post game between today and Wednesday. You're going to get either an Astros or a Texans post game every single day for the next few days. And Frank, I tried to spin it a little bit, but man, I've seen all I need to see from Steven Silas. And I know you're going to go, oh, it's early in the season, but man, this goes back to last year. This goes back to two years ago. You know, this is a consistency and it's, it's not just five games. Trust me. I understand the youth. I understand the circumstances, but let's get real offensively. Frank, I see tons of isolation, no variety of plays, no ball movement, no weak side screens. While I'm not a fan of point guard, point guard, Kevin Porter, this goes beyond him. Defensively, it's not the effort. It's the game plans. They opened with Trey Young, John ja Morant, and Giannis, yet it appeared as though they hadn't gone over a scouting report or conceived of a game plan against any of those three guys. You know what's coming. You've got the whole preseason to look this over, and that's what happened. He was... Asked about the possibility of trapping or blitzing Trey or Ja off pick and rolls with Jabari. Said Silas, he said he didn't have a chance to go through that with Jabari. What? (laughs) Yeah, that, that um, that was crazy to me, honestly. Because I've seen Jabari, even though if he's not great at it, you can't tell me, you can't tell that kid that, hey, we're gonna trap this player. So he, I think what I imagined coach meant was blitzing and recovering back to his spots where he's supposed to be. Uh, maybe Jabari isn't used to that, but why even do that? If, if you're going to have Jabari Smith at any point in the game play the five, just switch it. Just switch the pick and roll, switch the screens, and let him do the thing that God blessed him to do, which is guard the perimeter with his size. 
And that the fact that if you watch that game against John Moran, they had Jabari Smith, which who was drafted um, as one of the best, you know, big man perimeter defenders probably in the last decade playing a deep drop coverage, which is the craziest thing I've ever seen in my life um, on a from a schematic point of view and a mismanagement of a player's God given abilities. And it goes beyond just Jabari playing the drop or Kevin Porter playing, you know, uh, being such a ball dominant isolation player when his best skill sets are catching and shooting the ball. So some of these things kind of lend me to get to the point where I, I'm even confused whether are they willingly just being incompetent or is it just incompetent? And so these actions that I'm seeing, whether it's that or Garuba starting uh, one game against the best player in the world, the next game, he comes in third behind Boban. I just, I don't know if that, there's no logic that makes sense for, for me in that, you know, what Coach Silas is doing. Um, I'm trying to give him the benefit of the doubt, but man, it is getting harder and harder to game by game. Yeah, the rotations, you just said it. They're, they're flat out jokes. We, we, we can talk about why he won't with no consistent backup point guard or no legit backup point guard, I should say, that he won't split up Jalen and KB, KPJ, um, at least have one of those guys on the court. It seems like one half, like the Utah Jazz game on Wednesday, he's got them not splitting up time one half, and then the next half he, he has them splitting up time. It, it's like he doesn't really have an idea going into the game what his rotations are going to be. You feel like um, sometimes the wrong guys are, are getting playing time. Dacian Nix, you know, this might be a Silas thing or it might be an organizational thing, but why is he on the court? What, what does he do that's good? He is not an NBA player. No disrespect to this guy personally. I'm just talking about Dacian Nix as a player. I've been watching him for two years. The organization seems extremely excited about him. I have seen nothing to this point why we should be excited about him. Nothing to show me why Silas should play him and nothing that shows me why Josh Christopher isn't a better player than him, even though Josh Christopher hasn't exactly set the world on fire this year. And I feel like he's fallen back, but at least we know that when he plays well, he can help you out on occasion and, and, and score some points. Yeah. I, the roster leaves a lot to be this, uh, desired. And the, one of the key, like the biggest gaping hole we have right now is the backup point guard role. And I think what people are underselling that need for that specific type of player, because that's one of the few positions that impacts everybody else. And you could see in some parts of the game when um, Kevin Porter gets into a little bit too much tunnel vision in his offensive game, the other guys just stand around. We saw it with James Harden, a better player, and the impact he had on some of his teammates that they didn't, you know, you even heard rumors of people around the league saying they didn't want to come to Houston to just stand and watch the guy dribble the ball. So that aspect of it, especially on a young team with, with guys that need to develop, is really, really concerning for me because it's not just developing Kevin Porter or Jalen as ball handlers, but you also have to think of the team and the construct of the team, especially you have a de dependent player in Jabari Smith Jr. That's not somebody that's going to get his own shots. Um, a lot of the shots he takes are forced and the quality of the shots that are available to him aren't you know, being maximized. If you watch them play, a lot of the times where Jalen and Kevin Porter drive, they're going into five, you know, four or five defenders and their teammates are wide open, just begging for the ball and none of that ever makes it out there. So they need to look at it from the full team. And I feel like they're, they're investing too much in just the backcourt. And you're forgetting that we have a number three pick. And even though he had a great game um, on the first Utah game, um, you know, just the shot selection and the, the shot quality that he gets, if it's not like a bailout from one of the guards, um, it's really not good. A lot of them are four. So I like to see them be able to use their weapons a little bit more. I know they're young. That's where the coaching comes in. I feel like the guys aren't being put in the best position to be successful. Jabari is six foot 11. He's long. He's tall. You don't want him to just develop by standing on the three point line and waiting for somebody to pass him the ball on a, on, you know, a, a throw out on a drive or something like that. You've got to figure out ways to get him in the offense in different ways exactly. and, and it just doesn't happen. It just, we're not seeing it at all. And this should have be something that like, he should have been emphasized because we, we know Jalen and KPJ can get their shots anytime they want to. That's not hard. 
Yeah, they're using him as a role player. I mean, Jabari is, to me, in our offense, is the same as KJ or Garuba. And this is a number three pick. And But this is one thing about Silas' system that I want people to really look back and think of. Like, in that five-out system, how many good forwards or big men have really thrived in that? And once you think about it, it's, it's really a guard-centric system um, that focuses on the ball handler. And a lot of those forwards and big men are used as just screeners and utility tools for those ball handlers to be able to generate that offense. And so that is an aspect I hope they, you know, one of the coaches in that, you know, on the team is somebody that can focus on developing our big men uh, so that they can use their skills. Because when Jabari first came out, the knock on him was his inability to create his own shot. And which is probably going to be a, a something for him his whole career. But as we know, like I always say, you know, if you watch basketball long enough, there, there was a time when power forwards and, and big men ruled the league and they didn't need to have a Kyrie handle to be able to generate a shot. Put him in the high post, put him in the mid post, let him use his height and his frame, put him in favorable spots with the floor space where he can take advantage of certain mismatches and just shoot over guys. Let him work on some of those things and learn how to pass out of there. Because to me, the way I see Jabari developing, when he gets to his peak, he's going to make his money as that kind of high post player. And the three-pointer is just going to be icing on the cake uh, for him. But for him to generate those isolation plays, quote unquote, his are going to be a little different than Jalen's. I don't see him breaking out his defender and dunking on them. It's going to be him just working out of those kind of that mid-range and that high post area and just punishing guys that are smaller than him. I want to go out another little diatribe because I, I this is big picture stuff. I hear two terrible narratives from fans this season. And I know you've heard these same narratives in your Twitter spaces. People say, it's fine that we're bad this season because they want Wemby or Scoot. And I keep reminding people that even if you're bottom three, there's nearly a 73% chance you aren't getting either one of those. And if you think 73% not getting something is good odds, go put that in Vegas, take all your money and throw it in Vegas on something that you have a 73% chance of not getting. Um, I also hear people say, quote, well, this is our last chance to keep our own pick. So make it a good one. We want to make the playoff push next year. So, well, number one, you, you just don't go from terrible to a playoff team from one year to the next. That pretty much never haps, happens with the play in. You could still easily be a lottery team, even, you know, well, when you're not in the top six, you could still be one because, you know, you're going to have to do a play in and then you end up with the lottery and you're giving that lottery pick to OKC that year. Number two, you just drafted two top three talents. You only have a few years to prove to them that this organization is worth being a part of. With every year you waste, Frank, of incompetent coaching, you knock years off their development and your chances of turning this train around yeah um i've i go back and forth with the what to do i think the reason i'm worried about the team is not even the wins and the losses it's the quality of the basketball i'm seeing on the court and to the extent of what you were speaking of with um getting a top if we got Wemby on this team we'd still be the worst team next year with the way they look right now the lack of structure the lack of organization and both offense and uh, a lot of times defense Adding just high level talent to bad teams doesn't make the teams better. And I think that's what people are failing to see. They think there's a switch that, okay, we're gonna be serious now and just start beating these other NBA teams. It doesn't work like that. And what I wanna see from them is structure and things that let me know that if they added more talent to it then within that structure, then they would be able to improve. But not seeing that just tells me that no matter what we do, we could draft three Wembys and still the way they're playing, we would be the worst team in the league. So it's not about wins and losses to me, but, and you know, that's what Stone said. That's what Tillman said. Everybody toted that line um, coming into this season, but we do have to see development. And for me, the development I want to see is from coach Silas, because I think Jalen has showed me that he's, he's improved this game um, over the off season. Kevin Porter has showed me he's improved his game over the off season. What I, I'm seeing the same of that carried over from last year and the year before is the same just disorganization of the team. They don't look cohesive. It looks disjointed. Everything looks forced. It's a lot of isolation. Um, it just looks like a bad team. I just came before we, we got on here. I was watching Oklahoma City play um, the Clippers. Oklahoma City is a young team just like us. They have every excuse. They run plays. 
They look structured. Their coach coaches them. They have concepts within their offense that they follow through on. I watch the Magic. The same thing. I see Franz Wagner running point guard for the Magic with the back court, uh, front court with the uh, with um, Manute Bolson and Paulo Bancaro, and they look structured. So, what is it about the Houston Rockets that makes us look like we've never seen a basketball until the day of the game? I think that's really my confusion is because it doesn't matter if we get Wemby and Spook. If you bring them here with the way we're playing ball, we'll still be another lottery team, and we'd be giving those picks up to OKC next year. Look at the Memphis organization. That's a team that was built with a bunch of young guys, and they quickly picked it up and got good very fast and looked like they knew what they were doing. And you can compare Ja in a lot of ways to Jalen Green, and you can compare their roster talent similar to the Rockets' roster talent. There's not a lot of similarity if you went two or three years ago on Memphis and what was going on with them and what's going on with the Rockets right now. But OKC for sure is better coached. And we see San Antonio winning games with like talent that's, this is, I mean, they got nobody and they're, and they're winning games with that talent because they got great coaching and they got ball movement and they, they do stuff without the ball. And it looks like they know what they're doing out there where the Rockets just look like they're, you know, running around with their head cut off or something. I just don't get it. Yeah, it's 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 just a very weird experience to see. And a lot of people like to make comparisons like um, like you pointed out with San Antonio. And when I say, hey, we need better guard play for my back backcourt with Kevin Porter and Jalen Green, their response was, oh, you don't want we don't need a CP3 or John Stockton. I seen Tyus Jones's little I don't even know. I call him Tyus Jones's little brother over there in San Antonio. He's running point guard. He's not a top. 10 pick. He's just a regular guard that can play. I see, like I said, Franz Wagner, he's running pick and rolls and kicking out to shooters. So once again, the excuses about, you know, fit and it's not this person. I I'm past the point of blaming Kevin Porter, blaming Jalen. I don't blame any of those. Those are kids. Now I'm looking at the adults in the room in that you've been, Kosala says this is his third, um, third season he's coming into he's not the only coach in the NBA. We had COVID. It was the COVID year. It was the, we had injuries. My star player left me. Hey, welcome to the league. And, you know, it's just something he has to show us that we can trust him when he gets those Wemby's and when we want to win that he can do something. And right now, I really don't see that happening. Um, I don't know what's the, the delay is in that. I'm not sure what his philosophy is in training or, or um, developing players. But as a head coach, I can't say he's done anything. People give him the credit. Oh, he worked with Steph. He worked with, um, you know, LeBron or whoever else. But as a, that's an, as, a, as an assistant. It's one thing to have a relationship with a player as an assistant because you're not in charge of setting the foundation and the structural pieces for that team that he's on. You're just there to be a, a you know, almost like a friend and somebody like that. And all the teams he worked with those players on, they had head coaches that had the structure and foundation built. Now that he's the head coach, that line of I work with Steph doesn't really fit because not only do you have to work with these players, you also have to build the structure in which that they have to thrive in. Because while he was working with those players, those head coaches were probably being, you know, hard, you know, hard on their players and pushing them and making them run the right plays and all those things. So I just need to see that from him because I think this is a big year for him. And I don't know if, uh, you know, whatever, if they look like the way they're looking now, I'm not sure if the Rockets will extend him um, going forward into the future because I really don't see anything they should be confident in. Yeah, it looks even worse when you see what some of the Wizards and the, these other teams that we expected to be bad, Utah and San Antonio, you see what they're doing. And I get it. They're more veteran teams, these teams, but um, come on. I mean, it's just, it's night and day what's going on with those teams. And, and they're, those teams are beating some good teams. It's just not like they're beating, beating terrible teams. And yeah, I get it. The Rockets have played good teams too, but it, it's just the way they're getting beat and what's going on on the court. And Frank, I also, I got to talk about Rockets upper management because, you know, Eric Gordon and Boban being on the roster. I'm one of those that actually likes having veterans on a young roster. I think you are too. It's good to help out the young guys. My issue is not let's get all the veterans out, but Boban is notching or is nothing more than a mascot that appears like a PR stunt than a viable player. And if you like what Boban brings to the locker room, keep him around as a coach. I mean, there's not going to be this gold rush on Boban. If you wave him, he's probably 
going to, you know, like, hey, I, yeah, I'll take your coaching job. I, I, I can't see the rest of the league beating down his door. And Eric Gordon, and I know you have thoughts on this, <laughs> while perhaps being a hard worker off the court is not a vocal leader on or off the court. As a player, he's always been a poor ball mover who relies on one-on-one -on -one play, which is exactly the opposite example <laughs> that needs to be set for a young team like the Rockets. Yeah, Eric Gordon is, um, he looks like he's checked out. I think uh, his mind is somewhere else. Maybe he's back in Indiana in his pizza parlor. Um, but he is like, you know, you've seen the the videos of him on the uh, sideline just staring blankly into space as the team almost erupts into a fight. Um, he, he plays just like he's the only person on the court. I love EG, but um, I think his time has run his course here in Houston. And I'm not sure why he's still on the roster. He should have been moved probably about a year and a half ago. Uh, but, you know, here we are. And to the point of the type of veterans that these guys need, I think just bringing somebody that could organize the team on the court. Um, as you speak of upper management, I'm still waiting to see if they know how to put together a team. One thing I'll give Stone is he's done a great job drafting these guys. Uh, he's so far with some of the deals that he's made, he's been, you know, smart with them. But one thing I haven't seen is him put together a competent roster. And this goes back since the inception of all of this. The wow factor was a failure. Christian Wood and Tice were a failure. Now we're in this year. We have a team full of a bunch of young guys. We don't have a, a point guard that could get the guys, you know, slow down, get the pace right in different parts of the game. We don't have um, a big man that, you know, could do more than one thing. Um, you know, some of the, the the positions that they have are very redundant. They're guys that should have been moved, like you said, like with the Eric Gordons that are still here. So I'm just wondering what, what do they expect to happen um, with that? And, you know, this year is really big for them. And, you know, one thing we didn't speak about with next year is also the incentive to be good and the cap, the fact that they have cap flexibility. What free agent wants to come to this? You have to sell your team, right? <laughs> you have to sell your team. And yeah. that's a part of this that people don't talk about. You have that cap room. I don't want to get Terry Rozier or some C-level player to fill that gap when we're ready to be good. If you want to get one of the blue chippers, they have to be excited to come down to Houston. We have the players, like you mentioned earlier. Jalen Green is here. Jabari Smith is here. To a lesser extent, Kevin Porter is here. You have the talent. Show them, showcase them, and putting them in good structures where somebody's like, hmm, maybe I could be that piece for that team. The way we look now, who would want to come here? You know, it's just, it's, it's just something that a lot of things people think is just a uh, switch that you flip, but there's steps to becoming a, a contender or becoming a good team. My last guy that I want to talk about, and you could get into Jabari as well as, as well after this, but Tari Eason, per 36 minutes so far, averaging 15 points, 12 rebounds, two steals, one and a half blocks, while shooting almost 42% from three. Huge reason why the Rockets are a much better reason, rebounding team. Huge reason. Huge reason. He appears to be around every loose ball, doesn't turn the ball over better passer than most people realize for a team desperate for a player willing to do all the little things on a basketball court and who doesn't need plays for him to score. He's the perfect player. And I say that because I think he should be in the starting lineup with Jabari and Jalen who need to score the ball and need guys out there that are willing to do all those little things. He's given the same effort and same results in the regular season preseason summer league every single time he's been on the court without question he's one of the five best players on the team frank if he's not starting he's got to get 30 minutes a game for a team that's this bad yeah um you know i was we debated about this before and i'm, I'm kind of coming around to you now because i don't know what the coach i assumed i knew what they were doing keeping him off the bench to get a spark but with the way some of the ro the um, rotations have been, I'm I'm just kind of lost with with that. So I can't even make that argument. So yeah, I mean I think he should be starting. Um, as Tate even came back, he he didn't you know he he still looks like he's gonna need a couple games to get up and going. But I wasn't thrilled with you know some of the stuff that he was doing. It just reminded me of his limitations as well. And so for me right now, if the excuse of not playing your guys is because 
you don't, they can't touch the ball, then that's your fault, right? That's your system. So you have to break up all your talented guys, even with the LP thing and put them in different parts of the game. And this is the year for them to learn to work with each other. You have nothing to lose except games, build chemistry, build winning habits. I want to see Tari and Jabari play with each other. I love that synergy they showed in summer league. We get little glimpses of it. And when they're adjacent to each other, that's a tough switch for any NBA vet or rookie or whoever is trying to, um, you know, beat them off the dribble or whatever it is. I think that we need to expect more from the team. If you think that these players are good, Jalen needs to learn to play with Changun. He needs to learn to play with Tari. He needs to learn to play with uh, Jabari. He needs to learn to play with everybody so that we can know what we have before we get to next season. What I don't want is a bunch of questions unanswered because, you know, for some random reason, you have this guy coming in with a whole group of new players. You're not staggering these guys to see how well they do with each other. You're not playing two of your uh, top 20 draft picks together, barely any. Uh, you have a, 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 one of your best front court players doesn't play with your best back court players. It's just a mess um, right now. I hope they get it together. I hope it's just early season stuff. It's still very, very early in the season. I um, hope we see more. Um, but I just think that with the schedule coming up right now, the heat is going to turn up as these losses pile up. And I'm not a, I don't really care about the wins and losses. I do care about quality. And I'm disappointed in the quality of basketball that my Houston Rockets are showing right now, um, even in their losses. I would like them to at least look like a real team. Yeah, and and people on Twitter were saying, oh, you must have something against K.J. Martin. No, it's not that I have anything. Ag- I like K.J. Martin. But if if you're talking about a team that's going to win a championship, K.J. Martin's not in a starting lineup. He's going to have to show much more improvement to get there. And Tari Eason is already a better outside shooter than he is. But the most important thing is, you know, KJ Martin does some nice things. He's terrible at finishing around the basket. I don't know how you have that vertical and are so terrible at finishing around the basket. He blows like mishandles stuff, gets blocked, do whatever. Tari Eason's not great at it either. I get it. But when Tari Eason misses, he might get the rebound or, you know, tip the ball somewhere or do something. And when Kenyon Martin misses that layup or that dunk, it's over with. The play's done because he's kind of given up on the play. Sometimes he's arguing with the official or whatever. But, you know, my deal with Tari Eason is and why he should be in the starting lineup is look at Eric Gordon. What's the point of having Eric Gordon in the starting lineup? When he gets the ball, nobody else is touching it. And he just doesn't do a whole lot early in games. Why not bring him off the bench? Because Tari Eason's going to be able to do stuff if he doesn't touch the ball, that's the key. He does stuff without needing the ball in his hands. He makes things happen. He he gets out on the break and finishes on the break. He does all of those things, and he hustles all the time. I never have to worry about Tari Eason hustling. I don't have to see him like Eric Gordon on a fast break not get out to the three-point shooter because he just doesn't feel like it because he's old and he's like, I don't, why do why do I need to do this anymore? I need to go to a team that, you know, wants to give me a chance to win a championship. And that's what we saw with Eric Gordon at times against the jazz, the last couple of games. But I don't, I don't have to worry about that with Tari And it just, this is a no brainer. I, I, if I can see this as somebody that's never coached in my life, I don't understand how the Rockets can't see this. I'm sure they see it. One thing I, I noticed they're very, they're always late to, making those adjustments um, with the Tari thing. Yeah. I think Tari is going to be, he's sneakily like could be, you know, one of the steals of the entire draft. Um, you know, I love the energy he brings. He still makes rookie mistakes. If you watch him a lot of times he does get lost on different things, but he goes hard the whole time. So just by doing that, like you said, he gets points. Um, I just wish we ran a style of offense or a brand of offense that maximized everybody's um, abilities at the same time. Because all the great teams, that's what they do. Because they put pressure on you by the threat of every single person on that court being able to punish you for something in a given play. And for us, even watching Dallas, I don't like Dallas's offense. It's too reliant on Luca, and that's the what um, what our coach, coach Silas made his mark on greatest offense in you know in NBA history. But it gets to the playoffs, and if Luca isn't like dropping forty point triple doubles, um, they don't really have a shot. And so I don't want that. I want an offense that's able to maximize everybody, that's focused on motion, off-ball motion, movement, um, using Jabari's uh, shooting ability, 
using his length, uses uh, Jalen's drive ability, using his shooting, using uh, LP screening, using Tari's ability to work in transition and cut and move and, you know, smart passing and just ball movement, all these things. So these guys can really get that synergy together. Right now, we're still at ground zero. And for us to take the step into thinking about becoming a good team, this doesn't seem like this is going to be the year for it. So if they keep going like this, I'm going to just chalk this year up as another um, zero year, then go on. Maybe next year we'll show that we can actually be a team. But what people don't know, if you watch enough NBA, there's a cutoff line to where the tanking becomes just pure incompetence. And like you said, we drafted two, two top five picks. Usually, if you look at historically, when a team gets two top five picks, they make the playoffs within one year. So you don't have this, it's not, there's no precedent or it's not a lot of precedent for good teams that get three top five picks. Because when you get to that third top five pick, you're usually a bad team. If you need that third top five pick, if we get, you know, so that's the history that we're fighting against. Once you get to that third top five pick, it usually means something went wrong along the way that you've been, unless you just got extremely lucky. So there has to be a middle ground here of some form of, development and to the point of the of the Grizzlies they hit on every part of the draft and that's the sign of a good organization you don't always need to have the number one pick to say that I'm going to draft talent why not hit in, in the 11th spot like where they got Clay Thompson for the Warriors or some of these guys Giannis or you know all the Draymond the second round pick uh if you look at Memphis like I said Memphis hit Bain was like 20 something pick in the draft he's one of their key players all the guys up and down their roster besides Ja and Triple J are late picks that they just know how to scout, bring in, and develop. That's the trick right there. It's not the top five picks. You need your team to show you they can scout and develop these guys and make them into good NBA contributors. That'll tell me if we're going to be successful in the future. But people stop relying on just getting Wemby. Wemby's not going to save this team because if he comes here, he's just coming to you know nothing. We need just more. Uh, more stability, more structure within the, the 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 system that we run here. The schedule is murder coming up. There's a chance they could go on a major losing streak. Is it possible that Steven Silas, if this losing streak gets out of control in the next f- few games, is it possible that his job is in jeopardy? Lionel Hollins was not on the coaching staff last year. You know, they think a lot, this organization of, I think it's Abdel Fada, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, from Rio Grande Valley, who they brought in. Uh, John Lucas has been a head coach before. Um, what do you think? Is it possible that Silas could be replaced? I, mean, unless, I think the only thing that would, if he, something within the locker room where he loses, the players look like they don't care anymore. I think that, but to me, there is, you can lose and still have development and growth. And, and that's where I'm trying to find the balance for is I know we're not a great team and we're still young, but I want to see them build upon just the basic concepts of basketball. I want to see Kevin Porter be able to use his pick and roll thread ability to pass out to the shooters and do it at a consistent level and balance out the game and slow the pace. I want to see Jalen be more aggressive. Jalen becomes so passive. I don't know if it's because of his, his backcourt mate or just him, but I want to see him understand this is his team. You're the guy. You can't sit back and watch everything fall to craps. And just, this is your team. You get all, you're on the billboards, you're on the commercials. You have to fill in those shoes. And hopefully he shows that this season. I want to see Jabari keep getting, you know, he's a rookie. So I'll give him, uh, all the rookies get landing uh, space for me. But for, as far as the losing, if they improve and sneak up, sneak out one game here every six or seven games, fine. But if it's like we're 15 games in, 15 losing streak, the, they look like they don't care anymore, then I, I think that at that point, for the sake of just the, the kids, you might need to change the voice in the room. But I hope it doesn't get to that point because, as you know, everybody thinks Silas is a great guy. Um, and, maybe you know, I don't know if he just needs to get a balance of his coaching voice like he said he did. But I, I'm willing to give him the time, but he has to show us something in these next couple of weeks and months. You're more patient than I am. I'm – I've sure I've seen the, I've seen the time <laughs> in the last couple of years. It you know uh, this isn't like I said this is not five games for me. This is two years of seeing the same stuff. Uh, HDX Job Shop, what's going on over there, real quick? Uh, just the same old talking rockets. We do the live streams after the games. We do our 
our videos, just breaking down some of the games. And uh, we have our ATX Chop Shop uh, podcast, if anybody's interested. Um, that's HTX, or you could type in on YouTube Rockets Chop Shop and uh, kind of follow any of the content that you have. If you like uh, Rockets basketball, we try to cover every aspect of it. I need this to turn around. I, I got the over in Vegas a couple of weeks ago or a few weeks ago. So we, <laughs> we got to get this thing yeah, going, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> good luck. Yeah, I was. we had a podcast about that, and I, I picked the over too. And uh, I'm looking like a fool right now. So <laughs> you're not alone. <laughs> <laughs> All right, man. I'm going to talk to you in, a, in the next couple of weeks, but uh, thanks again for coming on. Love it. All right. Take care, brother. You're listening to Houston Sports Talk. Hey, you can support the show by subscribing on YouTube and commenting on the videos. Listen to Houston Sports Talk on Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, and Google. Don't forget to tell a friend and share our show on social media. Spread the word, everybody. Thanks for listening.